A little bit of uh, a maybe sort of reorientation from Lee's remarks. So, so just from a, a BC campus point of view, we're we're not an institution ourselves. We don't teach, we don't do courses, but we're a, an initiative of the Ministry of Advanced Education, whose goal and mandate is to really support the use of education technology and online learning at all 25 institutions, and so uh, not just UBC. Um, Thanks for coming to this uh, particular talk. I know this is a bit of an unusual talk to, to have the, the idea of a local open educational resource initiative on the table in the middle of a kind of uh, movement that has really been focused on global open educational resources. Um, I've actually given this talk quite a lot, so I thought for this conference I would change things up and use a completely different kind of model of presentation rather than a straight PowerPoint presentation and if I could get you to hand those out. So we're actually going to use some eye clickers and we're going to, um, I'm going to try to share with you, I'm going to give you a little few slides, a couple slides about just who we are and what we're about. Um, but then what I thought I'd do is, is position the initiative that, that we've been doing around open educational resources in, the, in a comparative way against two other open educational resource initiatives that I'm sure you all know really well, which, which are the, uh, the MIT Open Courseware and the Rice University Connections Project. And, and I thought I'd have us um, do that comparison using uh, Jeopardy. So. <laughs> so first, just a couple of uh, a quick orientation things, and then we're just going to jump right into it. So um, from a BC campus point of view, we, we really are structured around providing services to all of the colleges and universities in the province around these four areas, curriculum development and delivery, student services and data exchange, ICT infrastructure and communities and academic growth. And, and the talk today and our whole open education resource initiative is primarily of course focused here in the curriculum development delivery support area but also interestingly we've been uh, supporting the development of open education resources that have to do with professional learning opportunities for faculty. Um, the principal way that we've been doing our open education resource initiative is through this what's being called over the years the online program development fund and this has been a lump of money that the Ministry of Advanced Education has given BC campus to distribute out to all 25 post-secondary institutions annually. It's usually about a million dollars. The round that we just finished, the 2009 round, is the seventh round. It's targeted completely at the public post-secondary institutions in the province. It's not K-12 although Lynn is here and she's doing something similar in K-12 or a little bit different but, but uh, got that responsibility. A primary focus of this fund has been around uh, the formation of partnerships between institutions. So unlike say MIT where the, you know, the primary focus is around faculty within that single organization producing OER, here we've been looking to form cross-institutional partnerships and, and uh, so proposals that come in that are like that tend to get funded over those that just come from a single institution. There's been a fair amount of money put into this so far, so it's not been a small program, and there's been quite a number of grants, and all of it's gone into open educational resources. So, get ready for Jeopardy. So, um, here's how Jeopardy's going to work. You all have an eye clicker. Um, there's a number on the front of it. Those two big numbers are going to be your ID. The bottom number is the on-off button, so you'll have to turn it on. And um, this is round one. <laughs> Uh, okay, so there are uh, four categories. We're going to go with, um, we're going to compare and contrast. Actually, let me just go back for a sec. If, so this one has a number on the bottom. If you don't have a number on the front of yours, if you look on the back, the barcode that's on the back, the last two numbers of the barcode will be your number. So that's your unique ID. Okay? Everyone got it? 
You know who you are? I don't know who you are, but you're going to end up telling me. Um, so, so here's the notion of this game. We're going to compare and contrast these three initiatives. And I know you know very little about ours, um, but through the playing of Jeopardy, you're going to find out a little bit about ours and contrast it with these other two, who I'm sure you know more about. All right with that? All right, so round one. The four categories we're going to look at are funders and goals, technology, creators and users, and legal. So uh, who wants to start? Pick a category and a dollar value. Technology for 100. Technology for 100, okay. The clue is this OER initiative has been funded entirely by government public taxpayers money with an aim to develop online learning that gives students access to more courses and programs that helps them complete degrees, diplomas, and certificates. And if you think you know the answer to that, click any of the letters A through E on your clicker starting now. All right, that's enough. So 98 gets to go first. Who's 98? Randy? <laughs> so, so you have to, Jeopardy? Jeopardy requires you to say the response in a question. What is BC Campus? <laughs> Very good. So what is BC Campus? So that's our initiative. And Randy, you get to pick uh, the next category in dollar value. Uh, creators and users for 500. I don't know whether you can jump like that in Jeopardy. I think you have to work your way up. I always wondered why. You can, jump. can you jump? Yeah. Why would you want to? Creators and users for 500. The most popular resource in connections has been viewed that many times. It's actually written by a woman who teaches privately. And what subject area is this open education resource in? If you think you know the answer to that, go ahead and tell me with your clicker. Okay, so uh, 3E is the first one to respond, and yes? What is music? What is music is correct. So uh, that... In fact, the, uh, in, the, in the Connections Project, the top, I think, two or three resources are all by, the, by um, Diane Schmidt-Jones, I think her name is, who's written all of the music ones. And so you get to pick the next category. And Legal for 300. BC Campus created this Creative Commons derivative license for sharing within just the public post-secondary sector of British Columbia. If you think you know, you can tell me. Use your clicker to say. Okay. Uh, three eight. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so, uh, so what is BC Commons? So uh, our initiative, when we first rolled it out back in 2003, we tried to go like everyone else and use the Creative Commons license. We met a huge amount of resistance from faculty. They weren't willing to share their resources globally. They felt a huge amount of risk in terms of competition, loss of control. And so what we ended up doing is creating a unique license that is modeled just exactly the way Creative Commons is. It has a, you know, a human readable deed, a full license, a little code that you attach, uh, but it only shares with other educators in public post-secondary here in BC. Very different kind of concept. Might be conceived of as a boutique model, actually, of, um, of uh, of a Creative Commons license. And so uh, Norm left. Who wants to ask a question in Norm's absence? Mary, why don't you? Okay, I'll take funders and goals for 200. Funders and goals for 200. This OER initiative is two goals. Convey the interconnected nature of knowledge across disciplines, courses, and curricula, and move away from a solitary publishing and learning process to one based on connecting people into global communities that share knowledge. So of those three initiatives, MIT OpenCourseWare, BC Campus, Connections, which one has these goals? If you think you know, let me know. Interesting. Nobody knows? 
MIT OpenCourseWare? Uh, There's only three that we're comparing, BC Campus Connections or MIT OpenCourseWare. Which of those three has these goals? Connection. Let me know. Okay, somebody let me know. Who's C2? Who's C2? I think it's me because I clicked a button, but I don't know <laughs> anywhere else. Yeah. Are you C2? Yeah. Oh, yeah, go ahead. It's, what is MIT? No, it isn't. It is connections, so as Randy suggested. So this is, these are the goals of the Connections Initiative. Very interesting set of goals in terms of an OER initiative. Uh, quite different than those of BC Campus, who's been more focused, as you can imagine, from a provincial mandate on enabling this kind of uh, sharing within the province, not so much around creating connections of a global community. Can we ask questions? Sure, of course. Box. Uh, question to me. Connections is a US based uh, initiative, as are so many of these initiatives that articulate like that, so archive.org and, uh, and in a different vein. Why, does, why do US initiatives have the confidence or the arrogance even to suggest that they will be global uh, hosts for these things, whereas Canada, Australia, and New Zealand? Don't take that claim. They set up for provincial or regionalized or even parochial projects. I, th I think in Connections case, I mean, because really anyone can contribute resources to Connections, you don't have to be someone in the U.S., then they immediately see themselves as supporting a global set of participants. Um, I, I think that many of the initiatives that have become wildly popular are, are really trying to solve a global shortage of, it, of access to education. And so they make that part of their, their aim. Uh, and I answered this one. I get to pick. <laughs> uh, let's pick um, funders and goal. Oh, we did that one already. I'll just work my way up the stack on funders and goals. So this OER initiative emerged out of an Education Technology Council finding that there was no economically viable model for large-scale internet-based distance education. Which one of those three initiatives had their start with this? If you think you know, you can click your button and let me know. Two people. All right, so C2, I think that's you. Um, what is BC? No. How about uh, B7? Who's B7? I'm B7, it's a wild guess, but what is the uh, MIT? <laughs> Yes, yeah, that's right. So MIT had an Education Technology Council. They uh, worked heavily with faculty to, uh, to, to look at how they might put in place online education using MIT courseware. And there was no, the faculty's response was that given the amount of time that we have and the effort that we'd be willing to put into it, uh, we don't have uh, uh, any confidence that there could be an economically viable model where the institution would make money. And that led them to think about giving it away. Yeah. Sure. I think they're they're still uh, working on it to see. I I I think that all I'm trying to do is compare three of them. I'm not trying to compare all of them, but I think this is. Yeah. It's it, yeah. I, I'm trying to be a little bit provocative with these clues. So. Uh, and so you get to pick the next clue and category. So, uh, the white ones have been done? Not done. So pick something that hasn't been done. The white ones are... The white ones have been done. The white ones have been done. But you can try them. <laughs> Technology 200. Technology for 200. All right, so for this OER initiative, here are the technology components. An editing environment, a repository, content that allows users to create collections and assemble custom print-on-demand textbooks. Which OER initiative is doing this? You can tell me using your clicker. 
Oh, everybody knows this one. Some of you do. All right, so E0. Connections. It is connections, yes. So connections is the one that is very much focused on print-on-demand textbooks. Um, and I think one of the things that I'm suggesting here with that category is that you can actually compare and contrast these different OER initiatives based on this one single kind of criteria. Uh, technology for three This OER initiative is producing primarily PDF lecture notes, exams, and videos for use in campus-based courses. If you think you know the answer, go ahead and use your clicker. All right, AF. Mary? What is MIT? Yes, yes. So MIT is very much focused on campus-based courses. If you go to the OpenCourseWare site, primarily what you're looking at are PDF files. And you can see right away that their goal, if you will, is different than the Connections goal. And so one of the interesting things, I think, is when we talk at this conference, you're talking about open educational resources. They're not all the same. And yet we talk about them as if they're all the same. All right, so Mary, next category. Uh, I'll take creators and users for 300 All right. This particular initiative develops its resources by faculty and it's licensed and f licensed for sharing and reuse just with other faculty. Which initiative is doing this? All right, and E0. It sounds like the Canadian. <laughs> Yeah, this is the BC campus one. So unlike most of the other open education resource initiatives that are using the Creative Commons license, that means that it becomes shareable with almost anyone. The BC campus license uh, that we use, the BC Commons license, um, is constrained to sharing the, the resource with just other faculty in BC's public post-secondary system. And, and this, in, in retrospect, if I had to change anything, this would be the one thing that I change in terms of this license. Because when you look at the use cases now for all the other open educational resource initiatives, the vast majority of their users are actually students and self-learners. Is there a, um, a hope that at some point this will um, What I'd like to do, Mary, is actually. Um I don't think I can mandate those that have agreed to use this license to, re to use a different license. But what I'd like to do is create uh, a version of the BC Commons license that is open to students and then invite everyone to move from the current license to that license or to the Creative Commons license if they want. Do, do you not have the opportunity to have all the Creative Commons plus the BC Commons? Yes, to do, yes, yeah. So you can actually choose. So we're one of the few open educational resource initiatives that offers a choice. You can choose Creative Commons or you can choose BC Commons. One of the other uh, clues here will be about what percentage of faculty may, when offered that choice, choose what percent, choose Creative Commons versus BC Commons, please. Uh, my question is, uh, what that is uh, I have a question about this one, and that is it's for sharing and use just with other faculty and other just public post-secondary faculty in British Columbia. This one's not local. That's why it's local, yeah. Yeah, but why? Why do the Americans and the Canadians, Australians and New Zealanders have a preset mindset to, we are parochial? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we have access to So, so part of our reason is, I mean, part of our reason is that the ministry's interest is not global. The ministry's interest is in meeting the needs of British Columbia. Yes, and that makes me worry. The U.S. is motivation is global. Well, you made one brief passing comment earlier on that the teachers were not keen. Was, was that kind of the thing that? Yes, yeah. So they have the choice. They can choose Creative Commons if they want. We'll totally support them in that. We actually would prefer that they do that. But but they're not. If you offer them a choice, and I think this would be true for the other open educational resource initiatives too, if, if you were dealing primarily with faculty at an institution, you offer them a choice. Uh, it's just interesting to see what their, their choice is. Yeah, yeah, please. Um, 
mentioned uh, that the primary uses uh, so uh, so Christ Lana's uh, self-directed? For the other open education resource initiatives, yes. not for ours. So, yeah. Oh, not for you. Yeah. But uh, I guess it follows that it would be the same for you if you were to change. But no, hang on. It could be. Um, because I don't think the license practically affects their use. If it's available, they'll use it. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, the license is not even an issue. I, I think in our case, and as you saw in one of the earlier clues, the and in, in, in my opening remarks, the interest here in British Columbia from the funder is increasing the number of four credit courses that allow students to complete credentials faster anywhere in the province. That's their interest. Their interest isn't so much lifelong learners who may not be enrolled in a particular, you know, it's a very focused interest around completing degrees, certificates, diplomas, and offering students access to courses that enable them to do that. And, and so, the, you know, the, the, the goal, if you will, is quite substantially different. And, and it's been interesting to kind of talk about this within the province to see, you know, what appetite is there for making it a broader goal? Can we not open this up to the world or at least to all citizens of British Columbia, not just faculty? Randy? To clarify on that, because yeah. it's, it's, I think it's a really important distinction. In terms of the goal, mm -hmm. is it, has this initiative thus far been considered a resounding success, or just a success or mere success? What if success has been achieved in obtaining this goal? Mm -hmm. It depends how you measure success. I think if you were to measure success against the initial goal, which is increasing the number of courses and, and credentials that are available for students, you'd say it's a pretty big success. So there's something like uh, 29 different uh, full credentials that have made use of this fund to create courses that allow them to then provide their credential to students across the province. So, And then, and then if you were to count the number of resources, and there's a clue somewhere in here about that, uh, you'd, you'd see a pretty amazing um, amount of resources being produced. Okay, so I ask that because many OER initiatives, including the educator, it tries to be many things to many different people. And as a result, there's more turbulence and confusion sure. as people are trying to sort out which works and what doesn't work. So, so in a funded initiative, engaging the primary stakeholders and making sure that they're really happy mm -hmm. is really important if you're going to either cease, you know, you're going to compartmentalize the progress. Yes. Or, or and, or if you say, okay, well, and now we'd like to pursue something else. So we were successful in achieving our objectives here. Sure. You may want to engage with other stakeholders, kind of. but ensure Continued success. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, I, I mean, in the early days of this initiative, we used to be asked to report out on how many things have been built. You know, how many learning objects, how many courses, how many of this, how many of that. And now, what we're what we're starting to report out on is these are the number of credentials. So, you know, over five rounds of funding, a complete online degree in psychology got built involving six different institutions. Well, that's the kind of story that the ministry is looking for. Uh, who was it that answered this one? I forget what question we just answered. We got sidetracked there. Why doesn't someone else pick a, pick a category and a, and a value? Creators for 400. <laughs> there you go. So the MIT OCW audience is divided among students, educators, and self-learners. And of those three audience groups, this one makes up 17% of the users. So if you think you know the answer to that, use your clicker. And OK, EO or E0? Uh, I reckon it's students. No, it isn't. So how about 7E? Who's 7E? All right. Um, I didn't hear what he said. What? He said students. What is it called? Step learners? No. <laughs> so that only leaves one more. <laughs> So interestingly, when we talk about open educational resources, we're often thinking, oh, the, we're producing these. Uh, they're going to be shared and used with, with our other e educators. But when you start to look at the stats around usage, in MIT's case, only 17% of the use is coming from other educators. I just think it's a bit of a myth breaker. The other thing that Lana's home is that, you know, it is a, it's of those three cohorts, it's a 
smallest denominator, right? So you could be getting still a pretty high. Oh value. yes, sure. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah. I don't think it. I don't think it negates the model. No, no, not at all. No, I'm not trying to say that. I'm just trying to say that uh, a lot of our presumptions around how we think these things are being used are actually different than what's happening. Just wanted, it hasn't been my presumption, though, that we're creating this for other teachers. Ultimately, we're creating this for people to learn and access information. So they're encouraging statistics. So it's interesting to know why you said students, then. Oh, uh, because I, it was such a small group. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Have you looked at those resources? Yes, I mean, yeah. We're, we're talking about PDFs of uh, sure. fellow legal pages. All kinds of stuff, yeah. There, it was huge variation. It's a huge variation. Yes, yeah. There's a writer on the MIT Open Courseware site that says, um, this, of course, is not to be misconstrued. As an education, of course, yeah. So, right. And I'm very careful in making the distinction yeah. between the two. Sure. Sure, but I think everyone's gone into this thinking that these resources that we're producing, I'm going to license them through Creative Commons, they become shareable and modifiable. And so derivative works can be created by others. And, and the others that they're usually thinking about are by you know, my, my professional colleagues. And, and I'm not sure really that that's happening, I guess, is what's interesting. Really positive publicity and a lot of attention. Yeah, yeah. All right, I'm going to go back to the home page. And uh, I'll let someone else pick, because no one actually got this one. Floyd, why don't you have a stab at a category and a dollar value? Oh, or point. <laughs> I like the way everyone. I feel like Alex Trebek here. Um, this initiative, in addition to creating open education resources, uses open source software for its technology. So, which of those three initiatives uh, does that? And you can let me know with your clicker if you think you know. And E0? Connections. Connections, yeah. So I, I do think that, um, and this is something that, um, that we're looking at right now here at BC campuses. In the open space, and you're seeing it a lot at this conference, there's open education resources, there's open textbooks, open source software, open access research. You know, what potential is there to create a kind of larger strategy that involves all of these different kind of open initiatives collectively? I think that's uh, an untapped kind of possibility. And I just think uh, Connections is interesting in that it is perhaps the most open and is also utilizing not just open educational resource production and creation and, and distribution, but open source software to do so. Okay, Lee, you get to uh, you get to be not only the uh, the facilitator, but the <laughs> go ahead, pick a category. Um, Chipping for bingo, technology for four hundred. Technology for four hundred. The content delivery infrastructure of this initiative includes a sophisticated publishing engine, content staging server, content delivery network that utilizes the Edge Suite platform. Which initiative is doing this? Let me know with your clicker. One answer. Anyone else think they know? Two answers, three answers, all right. E0, is that you again? <laughs> yeah, go ahead, go ahead. You get to come back tomorrow as the grand champion. <laughs> Uh, is it MIT? It is MIT, yeah. So I, I, I think... Um, <laughs> it's clicker. <laughs> Go ahead, Lee. Pick another category and, and point value. Okay. Almost bigger technology 100. Technology 100. This OER initiative develops credit-based online learning courses that are delivered in Moodle, Desire to Learn, and Blackboard Web CT. So, <laughs> use your use your strategic clicking. <laughs> uh, seven four. 
Yeah, yeah. So we're a bit different here and quite significantly different from a lot of the other open education resource initiatives in that we're really deliberately trying to create online learning courses and resources that are deployed using learning management systems. This creates a whole additional range of issues for us around storing those resources in a repository in some sort of interoperable format that can be deployed through these different learning management systems uh, and on and on it goes. A very different set of technical technological issues than say creating PDFs. Uh, okay. Just close that. <laughs> Anyone can develop OER and contribute them to this initiative. If you think you know who or which initiative this is, go ahead and tell me. All right, AF. That's me. I'm going to say Connections. Connections is right. And interestingly, this is the. The Daily Double. <laughs> okay, so Mary, you get to you get to uh, to do this next question all by your by your lonesome. Uh, no one else can answer. But these o OER initiatives have generated the following numbers of resources, and essentially, the question is asking for you to say w which initiative has developed these. What is MIT? And the next, uh, well, so actually, these are all three initiatives. Which, which one of them? Which I know. So which one has done this one? Which one has done that one? And which one has done this one? Do you, do you want a lifeline? Okay. What do you think of the first one, lifeline? Oh, who's the lifeline? Connections. The first one will say what is connection. Okay. For the second one, we'll say what is MIT. Okay. The third one will say what is BC Campus. Or BC Campus, sure. Right. So, <laughs> play for the lifeline. So, a fair number of resources, um, and interestingly, on the BC Campus side, not only have we been funding courses, but smaller things like modules and quite a number of learning objects. We just started funding funding discrete open textbooks. And interestingly, over the years, we've funded a lot of stuff on science labs uh, and how to do online web-based science labs, uh, including the actual uh, funding for, for some of the technology and software required to do all that. Mary, you're up. Um, let's go with legal for 500. OK. Specific version of Creative Commons license used by these three OER initiatives differs. So those are the three different Creative Commons license that are used by the three initiatives. Who's using what? <laughs> Another one of those complicated objectives. So who uses Creative Commons attribution? Who uses attribution share alike? And who uses attribution share alike non-commercial? This is Mary's question. Oh. She can ask for a lifeline if she wants. Sure. Um, I'll say the third one is BC Campus. No. Attribution now? No. Someone else want to ask? Go ahead. Oh, I was just trying to give you a lifeline. Oh, actually, oh, I, I forgot to actually ask people to use their clickers. Hang on a sec here. I'm, I'm sorry, Mary. I picked on you. Yeah, yeah. OK, go ahead and tell me with your clicker if you think you know. Darn. I'm sorry. The show host got all confused. <laughs> OK, zero, zero. Who's zero, zero? OK, OK. So, so we. This one is. I'd 
And the third one is what is MIT Open Courseware? That's right, yeah. So, um, so interestingly, even though we're all using Creative Commons licenses, we're not all using the same Creative Commons license. And in fact, you know, of the three of us, the Connections Initiative is the most, if you want to think of it, the most open. And then we're sort of the next open. We actually allow commercial use, even though we're sort of funding publicly funded institutions to create these resources, we allow commercial use. And, and one of the reasons we do that is because uh, our legal counsel, when we were setting all this up, advised us that if you want continuing education departments in an institution to be able to use these resources, they often are not just cost recovery, but cost recovery plus, and that constitutes commercial use. Or if we were to ask Stephen, any kind of institutional use that charges a tuition uh, would constitute commercial use. So we very much decided uh, right at the very beginning not to specify non-commercial. I wonder if the non-commercial restriction that MIT uses explains the low percentage of education educators who are using their resources. <laughs> That's, I, don't, I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think it's the format that they're in. The videos and the things that are easy to use are, are used a lot. But I think there's another thing too, Susan. I think it's faculty culture. Mm -hmm. You know, most of them never wrote a textbook. They use all kinds of textbooks. However, when it comes to courseware, it's like there's a thing going on that Susie's that the champion for that it will be fun to watch in Florida. And that is Susie is the director of the Florida um, the Orange Grove Digital Repository. Mm. It has lots of things in it. And we've been trying to get faculty to use it for years. Last year we had a textbook affordability statute law passed and they built on it again this year. Susie with the, the state resource, the Orange Grove Digital Repository, is partnering with the University Press of Florida, which is a publisher, yeah. to provide online or print on demand. I think that's going to draw back to Yeah, I think so too. Pressure to, to provide textbooks more yeah. affordably and to and this is going to be a resource. I think this is going to be fun to watch. It'll it be fun to watch. Start finding other things there. Well, we provide anything that a teacher needs to teach with their faculty member. We're not focused. Yeah. So I'm wondering if you were to take um, that curatorial role in the publishing process you're going through, where you don't employ writers, you simply just sample all the free content and print on demand. Someone has to demand it, Lee. The, well, uh, a, a textbook on uh, financing your way through this economic crisis. OK, we can be uh, a university uh, print. If you're the faculty member that chooses those resources, Okay. You can put it together in a custom print on demand and have it on your doorstep. It's a shame that so much of it is non commercial. Thanks, Susie. So do, uh, you uh, you did that for one, so. Legal for $400. Legal for 400 all right, so here's, uh, when given a choice between licensing their work for global sharing via Creative Commons or licensing their work for local sharing via BC Commons, this percent of BC public post-secondary faculty pick Creative Commons. So I'll, I'll give you some leeway on this one even in terms of like, uh, let's say within, if you guess within 5%, I, I'll give you it. If you think you know the answer, go ahead and use your clicker. All right, seven four. Seventy four? Oh yeah, that's good. Okay. Oh good, you wanted to answer this one and you ninety percent chose BC Commons and ten percent chose the BC. Yeah, it's pretty close to that. It's uh well I, I did the I did the stats actually when I was putting this together. So over the first five over the first four years, it's about twelve percent that are choosing Creative Commons. So if you offer them a choice, it's not very many. But interestingly, the more years we offer this initiative, the more are choosing Creative Commons over time. So the last uh, one that we actually have numbers for it was more like twenty five percent choosing Creative Commons. And so it's just interesting over time whether whether you'd see a kind of more and more adoption of Creative Commons as the the license of choice. Well, some of it seems to me, at least in medicine, that there was, at least initially, and slowly eroding this perception that the, the curriculum was really place specific. Yeah. Is that, is that what you think is going on? 
No, I think that uh, I think that as I mentioned earlier, I think initially there was a huge fear about loss of control and about competition from institution X down the road or from a private institution like the University of Phoenix, let's say. And so as a result, people didn't want to openly share. And now over time they're realizing that that actually that fear hasn't played out that way and so they're more willing to kind of consider it. Also, I think that many of those that are interested in this, really seriously interested in it, are wanting to connect with other professional peers and they don't care where they are. Uh, as long as there's some sort of exchange and interaction around the resource and around its improvement over time. And we should probably wrap soon. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Oh, we almost made it through. One more. Oh, they don't want to leave. We'll do one more, one more. Okay. Uh, who did that one? You did that one. Uh, so you get to pick the next category and point value. This foundation provided funding support, early funding support to support two of these OER initiatives and this was their goal to globally equalize access to education by sponsoring high quality content made freely available on the web. It's a pretty easy one for probably most of you but go ahead and tell me. Two of you know. <laughs> zero, zero? Hewlett. Yeah, Hewlett. The Hewlett. <laughs> what is the Hewlett Foundation? Okay, and we can stop there. Thank you for I mean, that's a sign of how excellent that session was because the moderation just went out the window. I really found that quite good. Okay, thanks. So we have to reveal the answers to You want to know the last ones? Okay. <laughs> All right, so the in the funders and goals for 500, um, based on the success of this initiative, additional funding was supported to create OER for the trades. Yeah, and that's uh, BC campus. So we now are doing OER for the trades, and we just uh, released the first RFPs for professional cook and for welding. <laughs> It's a, a non-sustainable Actually, yeah, it, it, well, yeah, we can talk separately about that. So here was, um, I forget what this category was, but this OER initiative was deliberately structured to have minimal impact on faculty time. That's the MIT Open Courseware initiative. They deliberately are minimizing how much faculty time is involved with that initiative. And have, have been ever since the beginning. This was an easy one, or maybe not. These two legal issues are the most contentious for OER. Intellectual property. Intellectual property. Non-commercial. You could say non-commercial, but I actually think copyright is the, so those two I would say are, are the two most contentious based on my dealings with people. And the last one, uh, you all know this one is Creative Commons license, so. And then I, I actually had a, a final Jeopardy. <laughs> which, uh, which looked at the benefits of open educational resources. So I think if you, if you study uh, what everyone's saying, why they're doing open educational resource initiatives, they large, the benefits largely fall into these sort of six categories. And then what I was wanting to do is to um, just prompt you to, um, let me just see here. So, you know, which of these benefits are really focused, are the focus of these initiatives? So, uh, so that was it. Um, certainly from a BC campus point of view, our aim has been around collaboration and partnerships. That's been one of the main benefits that we've been targeting. Because most institutions are working very autonomously, not much interaction with other institutions, and so there's been a very heavy emphasis placed on getting partnerships formed between faculty at different institutions, and also joint creation of courses and programs collectively instead of something that's just within one institution. Uh, but I'd say open courseware has largely been uh, generating a marketing benefit and connections I think is trying to achieve a social benefit as well as an economic benefit. It's a kind of a tie there with connections I'd say. Thanks for coming. Hope you found that interesting. <laughs>